Hello, good morning. Welcome to Ireland AM. It is lovely to have you with us. The day is Thursday, the 7th of March. Thank you for informing us about that. Now, from weird and wonderful news to brilliant bundles of books, we've got plenty on the way this morning. Absolutely. Plenty. First up, just apparently 100 vacant property refurbishment grants. Mm -hmm. Which are the ones that are there, yeah. derelict homes, all that kind of stuff. They have been drawn down just 100 since the scheme was introduced in 2022. We're finding out why the uptake has been so low and how the scheme could benefit your home owning plans. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot, it's a lot, a lot, lot of, money of money that you can draw down. Yeah, That's at 7.35. And from soaps to sitcoms to fronting a new podcast, EastEnders actors Natalie Cassidy and Gavin and Stacey star Joanna Page join us because they're teaming up for a new project. You're going to shout Sonia at her. Sonia? I know. You're not my mother. That's a different <laughs> That's character. That's a different character. Yeah. That's terrible. It's just her. Get out of my pub. <laughs> <laughs> and in celebration of World Book Day, we'll be recommending some interactive books for your children. So think fairy tale fun, rhyming reads, and Amazon adventures. There's something for all ages. And Derek is also on the book buzz this morning. Where are you, Derek, and how are you getting on? Yes, happy World Book Day, guys. Well, following two days of glorious sunshine down in County Wexford, we certainly brought it back up here to South County Dublin. It's a dry and settled one out there this morning and holding pretty decent, in fact, some really nice sunshine as that ridge of high pressure keeping conditions dry and settled as we build our way into the weekend. Now, as you mentioned, guys, World Book Day out there today. Coming up later on, we're off to visit Skullnave Pori Primary School. Uh, we're going to be talking all things books. The kids, I believe, are going to be dressed up as their favourite character from their favourite book and even... I found a little book, look, Count Derek. <laughs> I'll be reading you an extract from that a little bit later on. What's your favourite book, guys? Oh, God, the image of you there, Derek, in Children's that. book. Give us a wah yeah. Can you do a, a Count Dracula? Can you do a wah ha ha I can do. Oh, anything. Oh, oh. There we go. Anything. There you go. There you go. That's Derek can do everything. Uh, talk to you later, Derek. Talk to you later. I come dressed up as a witch every day from Roldell, so it's fine, isn't it? There you go. There You're fine. I'm uh, looking forward to that. You need to be chill to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. Thank you, Chair, and a very good morning broadcasting live here from Ballyrowan in South County Dublin. Coming up later on this morning, we're off to visit Skull Nave Pori Primary School to celebrate World Book Day today. So that's all coming live with all these students and teachers at 8.45 into the next hour. Now, hope you're all doing safe and well this uh, 7th of March. It's a dry and settled one out there today. So let's take a look weather-wise now at how it's shaping up with Martin Rigney with us on cameras. And it is holding predominantly uh, dry across the island out there this morning. You'll be glad to hear... Uh, some bright spells now beginning to push through nice and early as we get a little bit of early morning brightness into the air some light showers through parts of South Kerry and into western Cork in those moderate to locally fresh south east to easterly winds. Now across today those winds will freshen for a time a little bit stronger onto the coast but elsewhere in fact we have a lovely ridge of high pressure now that will keep conditions dry and settled for the most part. Some bright spells with some cloud cover mixed in holding that rain at bay out into the Atlantic. Top valleys of around 9 to 12 degrees out there today then into tonight once again mainly dry and settled some patchy light showers here and there especially through eastern northeastern areas but elsewhere it is holding settled as we work our way into your Friday bit of a chilly night in store as well with values falling to one to five degrees so that's how we're shaping up here as it begins to brighten up here in Ballyrone South County Dublin we'll be back again live at 7.35 You need to be chilled to handle Irish weather that's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. Coming up, hospitals in the University Hospital Limerick Group in the Midwest. They are due to resume planned surgeries today after they were postponed for two days this week because of overcrowding in the emergency departments. Yeah, we're going to have that story and the rest of today's top stories after this quick break. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Independent. It's headline, Vulture Fund Forced to Give a Mother 0.5% Mortgage Rate. A vulture fund has been forced by a court to give an insolvent homeowner a longer-term mortgage interest rate of just 0.5%, offering hopes to other homeowners with vulture funds. You hope. 
The Irish Times headline, Taoiseach says a no vote would be a setback for the country. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar has said a no result in the referendum on family and care tomorrow would be a setback for the country as campaigners for and against the two proposed amendments to the constitution made final appeals to the electorate. The examiner's front page, children failed by HSE on palliative care. The HSE failed terminally ill children toward the end of their lives by not giving them access to palliative care services close to home. Chief Executive Bernard Gloucester has admitted. The mirror goes with five-year waiting list hell. A 10-year-old, Kylie Ann Stewart, who has waited five years for surgery for a curved spine, is in so much pain she can no longer bear even to sit in her wheelchair. She is one of 327 children across the country in need of a life-changing operation for scoliosis. Graceful. Six in calls in nine frantic hours. Why Shun quit? That's the top story on the Daily Mail today. Minister Catherine Martin has been called to clarify whether she engineered the resignation of the former RT chair. As new correspondence shows, she did not call Shuni Rala despite indications that she would resign. The Sun leads with Arsenal fan faces jail for Keane headbutt. A dad who allegedly headbutted Roy Keane faces the prospect of up to six months prison if convicted. The alleged attack took place after Arsenal's 3-1 home win over Manchester United back in September 2023. And the star leads with Barking Bad. A four-week-old puppy has been seized by Gardaí after an officer spotted the animal being traded for drugs. A guard that was on foot patrol in Dublin when they spotted the exchange. The puppy is now with the Dublin Rescue Centre. And the Herald goes with Pimp Archer gets jail for three months. A sex trafficker turned artist has been given a three-month prison sentence for failing to inform Gardaí of his whereabouts after he moved to Ireland from the UK. Now, elective surgery is to resume at all hospitals in the University of Limerick group uh, this morning after two days of cancellations. And joining us with that story and everything else this morning is Deputy Political Editor of the Irish Independent, Hugh O'Connell. Good morning to you. Good morning, you. morning A lot has been in the news over the last few days about the hospital, the University Hospital Limerick, but they are resuming those operations today. Yeah, they are, yeah. And this has been, become a major political issue as well in the last couple of days. Yeah. It's been raised in the Dole uh, twice, but I think by Sinn Féin, Marilyn mm -hmm. MacDonald raised mm -hmm. it yesterday. And, um, but this is a crisis which has been going on for some time and we've had some awful cases. Uh, Aoife Johnson, the 16-year-old girl yeah. who died, we're expecting a, a report by the former uh, Chief Justice, yeah. Frank Clark, into that shortly. Um, and no one really seems to be able to get a handle on this. Now, the opposition's position is that there needs to be m more resources into the hospital, but the government is, you know, legitimately making the case that the hospital has an awful lot of resources put into it it's in the last four or five years. Yeah, Simon Coveney, yes, I said yesterday over a thousand new people yeah. have been, um, a thousand new staff a thousand new there staff since 2019. But the bed yeah. capacity is still well under. OECD. Well, yeah, th and that's the argument being made, but then I suppose you know, the government would say we've, we've, I think, 100 extra beds in the last few years. There's a 96 bed unit opening um, in, the, in the coming, I think, in 2025. Mm -hmm. um, but it's One not just the Limerick area we have to remember. Yeah. This is including Tipperary, this is the, Nina, Clare. Like this, this is a is bigger the big area. issue. Is that this is a, a one emergency department for yeah. an area of four hundred thousand people, and if you compare that to other parts of the country, yeah. they have. Uh, more emergency departments per, per right. capita. Yeah. And that's, I think, one of the big issues. Uh, there was EDs in Nina and Ennis that were closed and have been uh, like downgraded effectively. They're kind of minor injury units mm -hmm. um, and do other care procedures. So this is a major problem um, that doesn't show any sign of going away. Um, one of the issues I think that's been identified is that there, compared to other hospitals, there are less consultant. There's less consultant cover outside of kind of normal working hours, so okay. it, at evenings and weekends, which means that there are delays in discharging patients from the hospital. So that creates all sorts of uh, knock-on consequences for emergency department for the emergency department, whereby they can't admit people because there's people in beds already that haven't yeah. been discharged because there isn't sufficient consultant cover. So these are all issues I think that ultimately fall on the government. Um, because the people hold the government uh, accountable for this and I think it's going to be a big problem uh, you know, going forward, particularly when you get these kind of cases like Aoife Johnson, for example. Yeah. I mean, you know, a beautiful young girl, 16 years of age, dies in appalling circumstances yeah. in the ED yeah. there. Well, the, and, well was, Mary was, Lou MacDonald did say lives have been lost yeah, due to I mean, it's true. And dangerous she, and she's, overcrowding. She, she's not the only one, uh, Aoife Johnson. So I think it's... It's something that's going to be a major problem for. Now, for I think we should clear it up that um, emergency and time critical surgeries did continue. Mm. 
it was selected surgeries that were elective, because I but know, all but elective surgeries had to I, be cancelled. Oh, for I know two that. Days. But it, the way it was being reported even yesterday, I was thinking, my God, they've cancelled every surgery which they, which they haven't. No, it's because no, it's yeah. so busy. They it's had so, to do yeah. all the other surgeries yeah. that were coming in. Listen, if you're in this area, and this is a huge area, as Hugh said, it's 400,000 people for this emergency department. And you're talking about the counties of Limerick, Clare, Tipperary. Um, I can like I've been there. I know how busy it is. Mm. I know how much the staff are doing, and it feels like we keep on kicking Limerick about this, but they're doing as much as they possibly can. Course, what is the, the reality if you are a staff member or if you're someone who visits these hospitals? Because they know they're doing everything that they can. And how do you feel politically about this and what the government are doing? 089 6 triple one because we know the HSE is in a bad way, but it's continually Limerick that's at the top of this. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's a big, I think it's, uh, it becomes a political problem. And, you know, the health yeah. minister will come under pressure over yeah. this. And, you and know, coming up to election in that area, yeah. that is going to be a huge yeah. I issue. I think it's the number one issue because patients and people living in that area don't feel safe. They don't feel safe yeah. going to that emergency yeah. department. Yeah. We have, uh, I think, uh, was it uh, Shane McGowan's sister bringing their, their elderly, her elderly her, father. Her father. To Dublin, Siobhan, driving yeah. into Dublin because she didn't want get, to go get yeah. the care that's shocking. in UHL. That's shocking. Uh, we're going to move on to um, another story, and this was a story that's been come, that's been um, kind of making the papers mm. and the news for the last couple of weeks. A barrister has said that an awful lot that's going on with RTE is overshadowing issues mm. all around the country, and this is about learning supports in schools. What's happening here? Are they downgrading learning supports in schools? So, the Department of Education last month published a revised special education teacher allocation model. Now, basically what this did, it's quite complex, but previously the number of uh, special education hours that were allocated to a school was based on enrolment, the proportion of pupils with complex needs, gender and the out outcomes of standardised assessments. Yeah. They've now removed the complex needs criterion because um, they've described it, I think, as erratic in terms of the data that they're getting from the HSE about this. So the result is that um, the model, which the Department of Education argues is a better model, uh, but there will be one in three schools will lose out on teaching hours. Now, what the department is saying is that these schools can uh, receive more hours if they make an appeal to the department and they make the case. But the issue is obviously... Surely it's people's needs that... It determines yeah, absolutely what how many hours but, you get. But they're saying they <laughs> they're don't saying have enough, don't... and they're taking some away. Yeah, but they're arguing that if you need more, you can you make the case to the department, and you will be allocated more. But the story in the Irish Times today makes the point that the large majority of, sc of schools, when they appeal, I think it's eighty six percent of appeals in relation to their hours are unsuccessful. So. <laughs> Uh, we've had a lot of groups in relation to this, as I am at the forefront yes. of this, yeah. saying uh, that this needs to be paused, this needs to be stopped. I know uh, from covering this at a political level, uh, there's some pressure within Fine Gael uh, to stop this, uh, to pause this potentially and to revert to the previous model. Uh, this is something, like you say, it's been quietly bubbling up and is, is a problem. You know, we're all focused on RT yeah. and, and that. And what's but, Norma Foley but, saying? That this well, is the best way forward? They're saying this is the best way forward. The department is arguing that this model will be a better model ultimately and that the uh, the special education hours will, will follow the pupil through their through the education okay. system. Because she said the new approach followed feedback from schools that yeah. existing criteria did not meet the needs of the schools, mm -hmm. but then they went and pulled one of the existing criteria instead of adding more criteria <sighs> so they could get more supports. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it seems <laughs> that way, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they'd put a different uh, I'm sure they would put a different thing. Yeah. You know, and, and ultimately, if, if this is what schools are feeding back to the department, then the departments have to react to that and they have to respond to that. I think the issue will be that the department has said that, look, if a school needs more hours, they'll get more hours. And there's a commitment around that. But the issue, as highlighted in the story today in the Irish Times, is that a lot of schools who've made appeals to the department in the past about this, 86% yeah. of them have been unsuccessful in their appeal. OK, and also interesting that we're talking about hours and yeah. uh, things for special needs, but also then it goes hand in hand with the lack of teachers. Anyway, it's all yeah, tied up. We'll stick with true. the special yeah. needs. Um, if this is something that affects you, and your children, as to what's going on in the sports in your school, you know we would love to hear from you this morning. 089 6 111 Now, can we go on to the... I came oh, in this Marian morning. Keys. And I oh, spotted Marion Keys. Marion Keys, <laughs> who I absolutely adore. Just found her. out she's from Limerick. She was born in Limerick. Well done, Marion. Um, <laughs> why can't you write nice books? Marion Keys reveals her harshest critic. Who could it possibly be? It's her mother. Her it's her mommy. mother. Typical it's Irish her mother. Mommy. That book is felt. <laughs> Filth. Tell us yeah. what she said. Full of filth, hookups, one night stands. <laughs> and she asked her daughter, why can't you write nice books? Yeah. Uh, it's not what you want to hear, but I suppose you wouldn't 
you, you know, you'd expect it almost from your mother. From your mother. This is an Irish, Irish mummy, yeah. Critics, I, you know? know, I love it. Her new um, book is coming out, My Favourite Mistake, and she's like, my mother's going to be there with the red pen going, <laughs> filth, filth, <laughs> filth. Why do you have to do yeah. this? You're embarrassing me. <laughs> Global The neighbours are talking about Global you again. Global bestseller. <laughs> but I was sitting there this morning going, I've got something in common with Marion Keys ahead of Mother's Day. We want to know the harshest things your mother has said about you. The men in this room won't know because you're oh, the best things that have ever no, happened to well, your mother. get it sometimes, but the, do you think the daughters yeah, get it? My, well, my sister maintains that I'm the favourite. She's, right. yeah. uh, She's younger than you yeah. and you're still the favourite. Yeah, she, she would say that. I mean, I, I, no, I disagree. You, you, disagree. you don't disagree, do no, you? No, I Come do on. disagree. I don't believe you. Are okay. you okay, your mom's favourite? Yeah. Yeah, you're your man's favourite. That's my sister's view, yeah. <laughs> the sister's uh, is my view. Can we hear, like, right now I'm going to get a text going, you don't have enough um, makeup on, you look sick. You don't have enough uh, lipstick on, you look sick. My mother is my harshest yeah, critic. My, no, my she's mother would not. text me sometimes yes, and say, Yes, she oh, you, is. You look oh, tired. Married. Leave Mary alone. You look tired. tired. Yeah. You look tired. tired. We'd love to hear from you. I'm just waiting for my wedding day for her to be, oh, God, you're looking a bit old. Oh, eight nine six triple one triple one. We'd love to hear from you. Ahead of Mother's Day, let's celebrate them in the oh, way they love no. best, by letting them sleep. Like us. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Hugh O'Connell from the Irish Hugh, his mo The much. mother's favourite, Hugh O'Connell. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> you. us. You know morning. it's true. Hugh's sister, please text us in and let us know. <laughs> Still to come, we've got the latest stats on the vacant property refurbishment grant. There's about 200,000 vacant properties Yeah, we'll Ireland. be looking at that, how it works and how many people have actually applied after this break. Very welcome back. Now, the vacant home renovation grant was rolled out nationwide in November of 2022, but since then, only 100 people have availed of it. Here to tell us what it is, who can get <laughs> it, and why the uptake has been so low, how you can use the grant to breathe new life into an old home. It's editor of Irish Country Living, Kira Leahy. Kira, it's lovely to have you here. Morning, guys. When you hear the word, a hundred. You're like, oh, oh my God, this has been, but it's a relatively new grant. So what is it? Is. It? it is. So, okay, we'll give an overview of what it is first and then we'll, we'll go into the numbers. So basically it is a grant that is now available for people to do up old, de old vacant homes or old derelict homes. And the money is big. Um, if it's a vacant home, it's up to 50,000 euros towards your building and your labour costs. If it's a derelict home, it's up to 70,000. So that's a big chunk of money. And a derelict housing a house would be one that's considered structurally unsound. Yep. So you would need to get engineer's reports to prove that or whatever, but it is a big chunk of money. So when you're, think, when you're talking about that level of money, why have, has there been only 100 people that have, that have got it to date? I guess we need to look at it in perspective, OK? It was launched in the summer of 2022, but it yep. rolled out nationwide in November 2022. So it's in operation a year and four months. Now, everybody knows that building works takes time. On average, it takes about 12 months and you can't draw down the money until you have done all the works, OK? So someone, for example... Well, you have to do the work you yourself. Have to, you have to pay for it You have to pay for it, exactly, yeah. And then you get the grant back. So... Uh, 100 people is a very low number, but let's look at it overall. There's actually been 6,034 people that have applied for it based on the most recent figures from the Department of Housing and 3,166 of them have been approved. So at the moment, there are 3,166 3, houses that are, are, are being worked they, on. They have been given the go-ahead to go, get the work done, and you will get mm. up to whatever amount that you have been approved for. OK, but there's 200, almost, and this is what they think it's underreported, 200,000 derelict, derelict and vacant homes mm -hmm. across Ireland. Absolutely. So people could be living someplace. But what's the situation if it's a vacant home up to €50,000? It has to be vacant for two years yes. or more. Okay, yes. So is that like a house that's been in probate and just no one's been living it for a while? Like, there would There's, have to be some... Or, or are the criteria much more strict than that? A, no, it is very strict that it has to be vacant for two years. But there's lots of different properties. But if I walk into a house, like, I'm looking at houses all the time that yeah. have definitely, like, through bro probate, have been uh, vacant sitting for Sitting there. Just sitting there, yes. you know, just kind of going to a little bit of, uh, you know, just getting a bit grotty. And I suppose the thing is, Marin, in cities, it is mostly houses that are in probate. Uh, but when you kind of... 
across the net wider and you look at rural Ireland, and which is why it is a really important scheme in Irish country living, you're looking at farmhouses that you might have an old grandparents' um, house that's been yeah. on the farm that hasn't been lived in, the, the grandparents have passed away. That farmhouse could be 100 years old. So it could be a derelict building that hasn't been lived in for years and years. Then you look at towns and villages during the um, Celtic Tiger when there was mass immigration. You could look, literally be looking at a property that's above a shop or above a pub that oh, hasn't been okay. used in a long time. So really, the criteria, it, like you know, it is actually a lot broader, especially when you're looking at rural Ireland. And how how complicated is to apply for it? What's the criteria? I mean, I've talked to a few people, and it's not too complicated, right? You're basically filling out an application form to your local authority. There are a few criteria. So it goes we, to the local authority. It goes to your local Nigeria. authority. As we mentioned, it has to be vacant for more than two years. It has to be built before 2008. Mm -hmm. You, this is a big one. Now. You need to be living in the property yourself when the work is done. You have to be the primary resident oh, you or it, it can be long term rented out. OK, but so, not a holiday home. But it's not an Airbnb because mm. this is part of the solution to the housing crisis. Yeah. So it is there to help people to get into vacant properties because doing up a, a property that is there is more sustainable than building a house from scratch. So it's, um, OK, sorry. Is this like then, say, you were left a house? You were left a house. If you were left a house, yeah, that's maybe absolutely. been there. Yeah. And you wanted to say, well, look, I'll do it up. But I don't so you, have the money. But I don't have the yeah. money. And that is there to but help. But you're still future. not getting the money. You still have to take a loan yes. to get to build it, to get the 50 grand. But I suppose they will give you on the on the knowing that you are, this is money definitely coming in. It's part of bridging loans and stuff yes. like you're that. You're essentially on a promise from the bank. Exactly. Like with yeah, the bank. Yeah. You're like and you, so um and, and then it is linked to the bank, okay? So um so, there, so people have asked me, what's the catch cure? The cure, what's the catch? There has to be a catch, right? The catch is called the clawback, okay? So what, what we said earlier is you need to be the primary resident or renting it out, okay? If you decide to sell that property after you've, so, after you've gotten the grant, you have to pay the money back with, if it's within the first 10 years. So if it's in within the first five years, you have to pay back 100% of the money. Yeah. If it's between the first five to 10 years, you have to pay back 75%. After the, the 10 years, then it's, it's, it's you know, okay. you're, you're done. Well, but it is time. But I was, I well, mean, live there for 10 years. Like if you're getting 75 grand or something towards building a new house or renovating yeah. a house. No, I, I, and the purpose is that it, it is all going back to the fact that this is there to help people get into homes. Yeah, this is not about anyone making money, money yeah. off flipping a yeah. house. Exactly. Yeah, OK. Th yeah. There's, I know someone who's using this. I know a couple of people, actually, who yeah. have applied for it, and they're just like, this has been a godsend. Like, ama amazing. They're doing yeah. the work themselves yeah. on the house, mm -hmm. and the bank have been, OK, you're going to get this grant back. Yeah. And it's en enabled them to bring a house back to life. Yeah. And they're very happy with it. Yeah. So the feedback from the people who have done it, and we know that it's low at the moment, but uh, over 6,000 people have applied. Yeah. Does it seem to be okay? Like, it seems to be working? Anybody that I've talked to at the moment has had... The, it's not actually the issue with the grant, it's an issue with getting the builder. The builder. We were just... Yeah. I was just about to say that, because... Obviously, you can then do it yourself. So if yeah. you're a, if you're good, if you're a builder, if you're it a can, handyman, yeah. Yeah. you can get in and do it yourself. But then you don't have to go to certain contractors. You can, uh, you can employ anybody. You can do the job yourself, okay? But the big thing to take into consideration with that is um, you can't claim for labour costs. <laughs> Okay, so like you can't be you can't be your paying yourself. Costs, exactly. I worked but, forty grand to so work on that. Oh, can I ask you why not? Because if you're employing a company, they're charging for their labour. Because it, look, it's part of the grant. But like, it, that mean, makes sense, though. You're you're, yeah, charge, you're they're charging you're, for their labour. <laughs> you're doing it. Why can't you charge for your labour? Look, it's, because no, we're it, not. They just want to go. Like I can understand yeah. why they're like you could be pulling pulling, pulling a fast one exactly. here. We can't see what your Exactly. What are you charging per hour, Alan? Like you know that kind of way. Like, I, were, I was you know, working overtime okay. until two o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Were you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? I'm paying myself 150 quid for an hour. That's fair. See, he would try and claim the labour costs. We're being reasonable, but I was like, I'm gonna get a bit of. Out of this. this is very different from retrofitting because retrofitting, obviously, there's a small number of companies that are doing it. There's big delays uh, yes, with people exactly. getting their homes retrofit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it is worth noticing that, uh, noting that there is that SEAI grant there, right? And that's yeah. up to about 30,000, um, depending on your property. I think it's between 24 and 30,000, depending on the type of property. You can also claim for that as well. 
So you can go for your 50K or your 70K. Yeah. And you can also go for your SEAI What's grant. What's the SEAI grant? So What's if you're for? going to get um, air to water. Oh, yeah. If you want to do If you want to do all those solar panels, solar panels everything like that, everything to make like that. it sustainable um, and to insulate so you could the nearly get 100,000. You could apply yeah. for nearly 100,000 if, if it's yeah. a... A derelict yeah, property. Absolutely. Up to like we are in the range of up to a thousand a hundred thousand. I'll have a house by the end of the day. Like, we all will. There we go. We'll all, I'm Two hundred thousand around the country. It has to be a all of us. I'm, I'm going out now, now to look for a derelict property. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be working on it. Can I, just one, Edward, one oh last God, thing work, yeah. is the work has to be done within thirteen months. Thirteen months, okay. yes, yeah. yeah, you have to get that done. Yeah. Uh, editor of Irish Country Living Magazine, uh Kira Leahy, as always with all the info. Thank you so much for that. Cheers. We'll be back with you. And it's in this morning's farmers journal. It's in this morning's farmers journal, everybody. Everybody get all of your all, info. The, all this info. All this info is part of your two week series. Okay. Thanks. Back with you in Ireland Day and very shortly. Thanks for staying with us. Now, from the hair off a movie star's head to a spiritual connection with fungi, it's all happening here this morning. We've seen some interesting nationwide news this week. Fungi's still around. He's just moved. He's just a moved bit. a bit. Okay. Content creator Hugh Carr is here to catch us up on these stories from around the country. Hugh, it is morning, lovely Andrew. to have you here. Let's go to the pub up? at uh, 14 minutes to 8 in the morning. As we always seem to do. At, yeah, uh, at point, sure, why not? We popping into the pub, into the Banshees of Inishirin, which is still huge in terms of the effect that it had on the movie industry mm -hmm. and stuff yeah. forever. And now it may be huge in someone's potential property life. They could own the pub that was in the film itself, which is what a bit of memorabilia to own. So how there did this come about? So what happened was, was Luke Mee, who owns a pub out in East Galway, uh, what, his wife is from Ackle Island, which is famously where the film was shot. Mm. And they asked, his sister was living out in the island, was wondering what happened to the pub that was actually in the film, you know, so iconic. And it just so happened that this is such a family oriented, like Irish oriented story. The sister-in-law's husband had worked on the security on the film and had found the pieces of set and said, here, can I just hold on to this if you're just going to throw it away? And they said, fire on ahead. So then whenever Luke was opening the pub, he thought, well, if you're not using that pub in your own house, I might as well put it into my actual pub. And now so it's they just, went uh, over with, with trucks or with vans and they took the pieces of the pub and brought it over. It took two trips, about two two hour trips each way to bring absolutely everything. And then they cross referenced the film with what they had in the pub themselves and managed to recreate the whole thing. So it's gone from Ackle Island mm -hmm. and then it's it was picked up mm -hmm. and moved to uh, Kilcarran in County Galway. Exactly, yeah. And now is that pub for sale? And now that pub is for sale. So if you're looking to get into both real pubs and fake pubs, uh, you can manage fake to... Pubs and, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of both, isn't it? Exactly. They rec it's, a, it's a fake real but pub. They, they, the reconstruction inside is actually very well done. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's a dead ringer for How the two pub. I actually didn't see that. Oh, they, they're, 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 keeping that they're keeping that on the, on the DL. They're, well, they're now that's some well, piece of movie go. memorabilia. You could buy the pub that was in the Banshees of Inishirin. <laughs> Speaking of movie, of movie memorabilia, this is a bit creepy. This is a bit different, yeah. I think I'd be more likely to buy a pub than to buy... A, a lock. lock of hair. <laughs> yeah, a bit strange. I think now we're already cashing in on the Killian Murphy buzz now that the mm -hmm. Oscars are on Sunday and there's a chance that maybe, you know, he could be coming home with the Best Actor yeah. Oscar. And so Paul Fraser uh, and auctioneers over in the UK have uh, locks of hair of all these random celebrities. They have Daniel Craig, they have uh, Chris. How did Eccleston. he get it? So it was a wig maker on Peaky Blinders. Oh, so okay. they had to cut a bit of his hair to kind of make, change his hair as the show was going on. And he just, that's what I was wondering as well. Like, why are you holding on to this? Like, what are you, like, are you already banking on this going well? There it is, Find there. It really, there's DNA in here. Like, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's creepy. <laughs> so, someone's going to clone a little Killian Murphy joking. now. I'm not joking, that's really <laughs> creepy. <laughs> a mini so, Killian Murphy running around. Really how, much, how much can you buy that for? So that's for about £6,000. That's all. Is that a pretty good at steal, I There you say. go. Um, and I'm going to be taking a little, like, if you've got a scissors here, please. <laughs> A lock of Mirren O'Connell's hair. The <laughs> bidding <laughs> opens now. I think that's the bidding, a, we'll I give think, you this bit here. See this bit here. I think that's here. an extension, so you get a bit of plastic out of that. <laughs>
<laughs> you, clone, you clone a bit of plastic. It'd be not lovely. Too much There's not enough plastic in the world. But Michael Jackson's hair sold for um, $100,000. This, this is the thing. There are other locks of hair there. There was the hair from when uh, Marilyn Monroe sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President is on that website. There is, and it's How huge. How can you sure those Alberto, hair give us a bit of that, and we'll say, <laughs> who do we say you are? Like He's got there, great hair. Is, is there an audit, audit, audit again? Watch out. Audit, <laughs> audit. Sorry, Daniel, can you come over and can we do a DNA swab to see if this hair is the same as your hair? <laughs> no, but you know how to... How They're not authenticated. Uh, authenticated yeah. is the word the, the I'm looking for. Authentication is the word of whoever is given the hair. Yeah. So. Yeah. Don't do it, guys. Okay. Buy yourself a nice pair of jeans. It'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, now, Pet Psychic has claimed that they can find... Sorry, Fungi. No. Fungi's still alive. But Isn't it? Is she claiming... But What's going on with claiming Pet Psychic? that is not. So it's a very broad claim that this yeah. woman is making. This American psychic is saying that she feels like he's not alive anymore, mm. but that they could possibly find where Fungi went to. So she rang in to uh, Irish Classic Hits and said that she had, was, had the ability to speak to animals, both living and dead, uh, which is a very specific skill, I would say. I don't know what course you can do to be able to, <laughs> to chat to, to animals from beyond the grave, but she said that she was able to get in contact with Fungi and that she, he could see three lights out of the cove. It was all very, very gene generic and I very love... general, but it could, listen, if they go to wherever she thinks that they be and they do find Fungi, then maybe we might yeah. need to start... Because nobody knows it. where poor Fungi's gone. No. Fungi's alive and well, guys. <laughs> Fungi alive is well. alive and well. <laughs> I just love that she rang into, like, back in the day, she rang into Classic Hits, uh, <laughs> Nighttime Talk. <laughs> love that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. OK, so, uh, dingle people, maybe Fungi will be found. Now, let's move on to the viral Willy Wonka experience that people have been talking about for the past week. There is, of course... An Irish person involved. Just like anywhere in the world you go, there's an Irish pub. Anyway, any scandal that's going, there's an Irish person somehow yes. involved in what's going on. So tell us about this story. I can't believe it. I feel like I've been on that tour. The amount of videos and stuff that I've been looking at this is ridiculous. For anyone who hasn't caught it, basically what had happened was was that uh, obviously Wonka came out over Christmas and there's been a big re-interest in... Oh my God, these videos are... They're, so boss, they're so funny. Yeah. Um, there's a big, massive interest again in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So a... <laughs> A uh, company over in Glasgow. Could you imagine? Sorry, they spent... our camera person, Pete, just saw the river of chocolate there. He's like, what? <laughs> they spent £35 a ticket on this. This was To walk in and just look at these really bad props. Yeah. Look, wouldn't, like... There's nothing there. It's, it's hilarious. terrible. Oh, here's Look at the, this, there's a mirror. The, and there's the unknown. Uh, the unknown, so, she's so, a 16-year-old. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So the whole thing was written by AI. This is what has happened, and it's been corroborated by Jenny from Dublin, who was at this. It's been corroborated by all other actors who were involved with this. It was 15 pages of absolute nonsense that was just thrown out and that they were told to learn off by heart by then. She was then told to come in for a costume fitting on Thursday. They had no costumes. She thought, well, maybe they're just a bit un unorganised. She got there. She saw just how unorganized they actually were. And basically what every single actor has been saying is that they were just winging the whole, the whole thing. thing. And, but it looks... If that was in Ireland, Joe Duffy, get a week out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone is. That is Jenny Fogarty from Dublin, who we haven't spoken to yet, who was involved. There she is. We there saw she Jenny is. absolutely everywhere. Jenny, you are a legend. Fair play to you oh, for so being an Oompa Loompa. Well, they're all on Cameo now. This is the thing. You they can, are you all can, on Cameo. You can book in to get a message, a birthday message from the Oompa Loompas. Get a message oh, from God. Jenny Fogarty. <laughs> Hugh Carr, thank you so thank much you for so bringing much us for those, those <laughs> stories. Uh, still to come this morning, we're catching up with acting royalty, Joanna Page from Gavin and Stacey. And of course, Sonia, Natalie Cassidy is going to be here. Yes, and Derek's meeting some iconic book characters to celebrate World Book Day. We'll see you in a few minutes. Very welcome back to Ireland AM. Lots still to come over the next two hours. Now at 8.15, cyclist Sean Landers joins us to call for increased awareness of cyclists on our roads. This is after a tragic accident took the life of his partner, Gabriella. And it's World Book Day today, and we'll be taking a look at some great authors and illustrators whose books put the buzz back into reading. Uh, plus, a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about a brand new podcast with, there we go. There we go. It's Natalie them. Cassidy and Joanna Page from Gavin and Stacey. They'll be discussing their TV tastes and perfecting the art of the podcast at 920. And of course, Sonia in EastEnders. 
Now, our favourite Italian chef, because he's the only Italian chef we have, he's in the kitchen, <laughs> Alberto. Alberto. Good, good, morning, good, morning, Alberto. good morning, good morning, good morning. You're, you're making a cake today. Yes, today is because Sunday, it's Mother's Day, so a cake sounds better than risotto or spaghetti for your mom. You know? <laughs> put, put a little bit of effort and make a nice cake, OK? How many cakes are you making? Because that's that's some bag of flour, no, my friend. It's the, it's the smallest one I could find. Is that the smallest one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything with Alberto is super sized. Isn't that it? Thank you so much, Alberto. No Looking forward to that. Uh, Derek's catching up with some students in Dublin today and they're reading rings around him. Derek, how are you doing? Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Welcome down here, guys, to Skull Name Park! <laughs> I am dressed up as Willy Wonka to celebrate World Book Day. We've got Miss Jennings here on Priya Ida. Hello, Miss Jennings. How about your birth? This is called Name Poetry. Uh, what a fun day we have today. Oh, we have the best day lined up here. It's World Book Day here, and every year we all get dressed up and we have loads of fun activities. So Including we're looking forward to it. little Eva down here. Who are you dressed up as, Eva? Um, the awful auntie. The awful auntie, and you had your lipstick on this morning, yeah. nice and early. Yeah. And what about you, little Tom? Mr. Bum. Mr. Bum. Can I see your little book as well? Oh, would you look at that little Mr. Bum here. <laughs> we'll have lots more here from Skull Lane Fork right across the morning. But for now, big cheer, guys. <laughs> Back to studio. Derek there is Willy Wonka is better than the Glasgow Willy Wonka experience, isn't it? <laughs> the whole thing looks better exactly. than the Glasgow Willy Wonka experience. I paid 35 quid to see him there. That was better than everything they did in Glasgow. Well done, Derek. Well done. Now it's time to take a look at the morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Independent. It's headline, Vulture Fund forced to give a mother a 0.5% mortgage rate. A vulture fund has been forced by a court to give an insolvent homeowner a long-term mortgage interest rate of just 0.5%. And what could be good news for other uh, homeowners whose homes are with vulture funds? The Irish Times headline Taoiseach says a no vote would be a setback for the country. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar has said a no result in the referendum on family and care tomorrow would be a setback for the country as campaigners for and against the two proposed amendments to the Constitution made final appeals to the electorate. The examiner leads with children failed by HSE on palliative care. The HSE, quote, failed terminally ill children towards the end of their lives by not giving them access to palliative care services close to their homes. Chief Executive Bernard Gloucester has admitted. The mirror goes with five-year waiting list hell. A 10-year-old Kylie Ann Stewart, who has waited five years for surgery for a curved spine, is in so much pain she can no longer even sit in her wheelchair. She's on uh, one of 327 children across the country who's in need of life-changing operations for scoliosis. Six calls in nine frantic hours. Why Shun quit? That's the top story on the Daily Mail. Minister Catherine Martin has been called to clarify whether she engineered the resignation of the former RTE chair. As new correspondence shows, she did not call Shun Nirala despite indications that Shun would resign if she didn't receive a call. The Sun leads with Arsenal fan faces jail for Keane headbutt. A dad who allegedly headbutted Roy Keane faces the prospect of up to six months prison if convicted. The alleged attack took place after Arsenal's 3-1 home win over Manchester United back in September 2023. The Star's front page barking bad. A four-week-old puppy has been seized by Angarda Siakana after an officer spotted the animal being traded for drugs. A guard that was on foot patrol in Dublin when they spotted the exchange. The puppy is now with a Dublin animal rescue. The Herald goes with Pimp Archer gets jailed for three months. A sex trafficker turned artist has been given a three-month prison sentence for failing to inform Gardy of his whereabouts after he moved to Ireland from the UK. And now we've got some of your texts. Uh, we were chatting a little bit earlier on and this is on the back of UHL, uh, the, the hospital group yep. in Limerick, not uh, the group, not just one uh, hospital. It was closed for elective surgeries for two days, reopening again today. And Catherine has a positive message about Limerick. She did. She's, Catherine said, I've been an oncology patient at UHL since July and the staff have been amazing. I've been treated with the utmost kindness and respect from all the staff and it seems like nobody wants to focus on the good that is done there for the patients and everybody else. They just talk about the problems that's there. Limerick Hospital saves lives. And we do know that, and we do know the staff in the hospitals are amazing, but... We also have to talk about the fact that it can't operate as a proper hospital. Yeah. Unfortunately, because if we don't talk about it, then we're just moment, ignoring it. Yeah, it really can't yeah. and, and has been 
for a long yeah. time it been in real trouble. It really has. Um, are we moving on to yeah. Marion Keys? Marion Keys is on the front of uh, the Daily Mail today and it's a picture with her fabulous mother and she says, why can't you write nice books? Marion <laughs> Keys reveals her harshest critic, who is her mother, who she says will look at her new book, My Favourite Mistake, with a red pen, go through it and just write filth, filth, filth. filth. Why, why can't you write nice Marian, books? Marion, just write nice books. All and then we asked you, what, what do your mother, has your mother ever said anything to you? Harshest critic. Harshest critic. Is your mother your harshest critic? Yvette says, my mum said to me, Aren't you so lucky to have a nice fat face like your sister? She'll never get wrinkles. <laughs> Seriously. Oh Mothers. Mothers. <laughs> Jamanda says, my mother once told me I look like a corpse. Did she come at you? she come at you with the lipstick on? Put on some lipstick. Put, on, put a bit of blush on there. Jenny says, when we found out that our baby was going to be a boy, my mother said... How lovely. If I could go back in time, I'd have all boys. They're much easier. Me and my sister were just sitting there looking at her. Like a chopped liver. Like a chopped liver. Now, if I could go back in time, I'd have boys. I wouldn't have any of you as girls. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you this morning. To celebrate Mother's Day, yeah. we're going to hear the fabulous, harsh things that your mother say to us. You know that they do. 0896 111 one. And let me guess, that will all be from women, not from boys, because they love the boys. Oh, we love the boys. Uh, lots more still to come in Ireland. Yeah, we'll be back in a few minutes. In a minute. Back to Ireland AM now in May of last year. Sean Landers and his girlfriend Gabriella Glodonita were out cycling when a tragic collision saw Gabriella sadly lose her life. And Sean joins us now this morning to share his story alongside Paul Norton from Cycling Ireland. Good morning to you, and you're both very welcome. Thank morning. you so much for coming in and talking to us. Sean, um, can you tell us about Gabrielle and both of your love for cycling? Uh, yeah, I mean. <clears throat> Myself and Gabrielle have been, we were seeing each other for seven and a half years. Um, we started going out in secondary school together um, and I guess we kept up our relationship then through college and through working. And it wasn't, I guess, until 2020 where she took up cycling kind of with the lockdowns and stuff. And uh, yeah, like, wow, she took to it straight away. Like she had a huge talent and, um, you know, she quickly started doing local races and then yeah. climbed through the ranks and um, became basically in 2022. She is one of the top cyclists in the country and um, she won the National Road Series, which is like a collection of the most important races that we have here, kind of in one league system. And she won the overall league for that. So. So it wasn't just the cycling that we're talking about, you know, get people on public transport and cycling. You, you're both serious cyclists. Yeah. And you have been for years, you've been cycling, Sean. Oh, yeah, I've been doing it for about 10 years. 10 now. years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm really sorry about this, but can you bring us back to that day last May and what happened? Yeah. Um, it was just an innocent day. Like, we were just going out for a spin together. Um, we, it was like at the start of the summer, so it was like, you know, the good weather had just come and it was a really sunny day. And then um, we were hoping to just head out and go for it, get a grab a coffee. It was just a short spin together. It was Saturday morning and um, yeah, I mean, I guess you know what happened. Like it's, uh, you know, we never really got to make it to the coffee and. Um, what, can you, I know I'm really sorry about this, but can you tell us what, there was a collision? Yeah. So I didn't see the collision firsthand, so I stopped on the road. Yeah. But I turned the corner and I saw, just saw the car, you know, all smashed up. And I saw, you know, the windscreen smashed and the bonnet smashed. And, but I, I couldn't see her, like she was nowhere to be seen. Or, and, and I, you know, I was calling her name and you know, I couldn't see her. And eventually I found her body she was upside down in the ditch and tried to do CPR and stuff to to try save her, but um, her injuries were just too severe and there was nothing I could have done to save her. Like, yeah. And she was we, she was obviously taken straight. The, the the emergency services arrived, took her to hospital. No, she was pronounced. She dead was pronounced dead at the time. 
in light of something like that and you have kindly decided to come in and talk to us today because you've gone through just can't even imagine how you're going through this so in light of that uh, how are you how 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 do you and her family rebuild your lives because she was doing something that she loved you're going yeah. for a cup of coffee yeah i mean it was so harmless wasn't it like yeah but I don't know. It's a funny question. How are you? I don't know how to answer it, really. Not great is the honest answer. Yeah. Like, I guess I've been pretty broken since I lost her, like, so. And to lose her so young, but also in that way, it's it's been so hard to deal with, like. Because um, you were together since you were in school. You, what, what age was she? Um, seven. We were 17 when we started going out. Um, and what she was age? 24 and she was killed. So. Are you still cycling, Sean? I am. Yeah, I... I kind of forced myself to like I went out the day after it and I went out with a friend and I kind of thought if I don't go out then I'd never ever go out again and I kind of forced myself to and I know she wouldn't want me to stop like that's the last thing she'd want for this to happen and so yeah I've been doing it but I can tell you I haven't been enjoying it. No and I was going to say there yeah. must be a totally different mindset now to when you when you go out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and why do you want to continue? <clears throat> I guess it's something I've always done, like, and it's part of my life. It's a huge part of my life. Um, but I mean, I guess like when you are on the road and you get that aggression from drivers and close passes and stuff, you get such a sinking feeling because, man, I've seen what a car can do to yeah. someone. And, and do you see that regularly? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I see it a lot. Yeah. I think it's worse than ever. Like, with it. Really? Mm -hmm. You've just then said, I can see what a car can do to someone. And I don't think any of us can put ourselves in, in your shoes. But another member of the UCD Cycling Club, we have to mention here, yeah. father of three, John Walsh, he lost his life on the roads just <coughs> three <coughs> weeks ago. Paul, these are people going out for a cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, it's, it's terrifying. It is. Um, these are girlfriends, their husbands, their fathers, um, just going out either for enjoying the sport, for their own health, mental health, getting to and from work, to and from school. So, yeah, it's uh, it is you know it's concerning. You know, from from our point of view as the national governing body for cycling, we hear from our members all the time that you know it's they feel um, in danger. You know, whether that's real danger or perceived feeling, I think both have merit and. Kind of in response to that, we, you know, we have set up a, an advocacy working group in in Cycling Ireland. Historically, we would have been a governing body just for the sport of cycling. Yeah. But in more recent years, um, we've uh, we're we're looking into to more uh, cycling for all. You know, the vast majority of our members are leisure cyclists. They're not yeah. Yeah. racing cyclists. Yeah. Um, and you know, in response to the, the the vast uptake in people cycling we we've kind of broadened our our horizons in terms of the memberships we offer and because things like that we are being encouraged now to get out and cycle yeah. to use like uh, cycling cycle lanes are being built everywhere mm -hmm. what are the numbers of, of people of injuries mm -hmm. and fatalities yeah, across so the country is it many it is yeah no it's uh well in in proportion it is um and to be honest one is too many yeah no um and it, we we work with various stakeholders like the RSA, the, the, the Department of Transport, the, the NTA and the Garda Síochána. The RSA provided us with um, a report and some statistics. So um, it, on average between the, over the last four to five years, there's been about eight fatalities. So that will kind of range between six to ten um, a year. 80% um, of those fatalities are happening during daylight time and um, two thirds of those fatalities are happening on roads with speed limits above 80 kilometers per hour and a quarter of them are at junctions um, and then for every one fatality there's 32 people who cycle who are seriously injured and again those um, statistics are kind of yeah. similar in terms of 80 percent on on a daylight time on yeah. very fast roads and stuff. Mm. And I suppose, you know, sitting here talking about <coughs> statistics, Gabriella mm. wasn't a statistic 
to you, Sean. She wasn't a statistic to her friends, mm -hmm. her family members and her colleagues and everyone who loved her. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just seeing your pictures there together, we're not even at her year anniversary and you have decided to talk about her or her tragic death and what we need to do. Why have you decided to do this? Why have you decided to go, okay, I need to do something about this? Well, like, I just think that I have a powerful story to tell and I think that people will listen to me. Um, you know, I haven't learned anything about how to talk about road safety or I haven't learned any skills as to how to convey an argument, but I'm just the same person I was, except now people will listen to me. No one would have listened to me before. I would have just been a annoying cyclist trying to mm. pitch for road safety. But now people will listen and I have a voice and I think that a lot of people are very grateful for what I do at that yeah. cycle and they, they're they thankful that I'm trying to make it a little bit better. And if I can get in the ears of some of the drivers that are behind them when we're out cycling that are driving the cars that can kill us, then I think that's a good thing. And is, is that the thing? It is to like the message to maybe people who are watching this morning, if you're driving that car and you see a cyclist, move out of the way, slow down, do small little things just to keep them safe? Yeah, well, I guess I just wish we'd I'd like be able to f combat the aggression that's happening on the roads. And like, it seems that drivers are just are getting more and more aggressive and there's more hatred towards cyclists. Like, and it's, it's like it's the same sort of thing that you don't uphold those standards to other kind of populations and, and road users too. Like if a pedestrian presses a, pedestrian button and the cars come to a stop, wait and come back up to speed again. They might have lost 30 seconds yeah. on their journey, but they're not revving their engine, going really close to the pedestrian, beeping the horn at them like they do to us like on a bike. And well, we were just talking about it yesterday in our news mingle and mm. we had Anne who was like, oh God, the annoying, you know, the cycle lanes are so annoying. Mm. And it does feel like it has become, as you mentioned, I'm not just another annoying cyclist that there is this perceived us versus them attitude mm -hmm. when it comes to road users. Is that how you feel? And can you tell us some, so, so you, do you feel like when you're out cycling that cars and everyone's coming like really close to you? Yeah, like there's, there seems to be sometimes where it's just a bit of ignorance and maybe they don't know, they haven't, the driver has never been on a bike before and they don't know that feeling of a car washing past you, you know, yeah. like that close to your, your elbow. But then there's also, the scarier thing for me is the aggression and the people who purposely will overtake you and then like it's happened to brake check you or like, you know, they say to you, it's been said out the window, like next time I won't miss. And you're kind of going like, have I been subject to a death sentence by you for just cycling my bike? You know what I mean? And like cyclists have been described as like bonnet decorations and stuff. And, and you're just like, how is this supposed what? to make me feel like when I read those stuff online and like it's such a scary place to think that these people are actually out on the roads that say these things about cyclists and like, you know, like to think that that's what's being said and that's what happened to Gabrielle. Like it's that just, is just you know. a scandalous. And do you know what I, I say, Sean, fair play to you for coming in this morning, because I know if anyone's looking in this morning now, I think I know as a driver, I'll think twice re when I, re I re-examine my driving when it comes to cyclists because of your story this morning. And that's that's one person that you've changed now from today. I and I'm the sure message, there's so many, so many yeah. more. I think the message is that we all have biases, you know, um, we, you know, it's, it's human nature, you know, and if you're behind the wheel of a car and you, you come across a cyclist, um, that natural bias kicks in and I guess well, we're both asking people, you know, if, if you're behind the wheel of a car, you come across a person on a bike, try to see them as that it's a person on a bike. It's not a, a cyclist, you know, yeah. um, and that they're we're all just trying to get somewhere um, whether it's so... home for home to loved ones or getting to work or to school. Um, yeah, we're all just people going somewhere. I don't at know the end if I'm seeming naive that someone would say something like you're a bonnet decoration or next time I won't miss. Yeah. And you're still continuing to do it. And I know that, of course, your family are worried about you um, because of what happened. But we need to remember Gabriella today yeah. and her family. And if we can change our behaviours in one way.
Mm-hmm. Uh, she has lost her life. It's unbelievable. Uh, Sean Landers from the uh, UCD Cycling Club and Paul Norton, Interim Participation Manager of Cycling Ireland. Thank you so much. Thank and Sean, both. I can't thank you enough for coming in. I'm so sorry for your terrible yeah, loss. Sorry. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, thank Sean. You. Thanks for staying with us. Now, we've got a tasty treat in the kitchen because Alberto Rossi's in it. Yes, Alberto. <laughs> <laughs> we fell for it again. Oh, Colin, Colin HR. Alberto. It's hard to have nine yet. There's, it's not nine, oh, it's before the exactly. Come here to me now, you. You're not making any pasta today. No, today You're we making... are making a, a, a cake. What are we making? What's it called? So it's called Torta delle Rose or Roses Cake because it's just the way it looks when it comes out of the oven, no? Okay. And uh, I said it's for Mother's Day. You know, get baking. Get, get baking from nice. this day. Get know? baking. And no, if, you have, if you have no flour, we'll send some, ar- we'll <laughs> send some around you can, to you. <laughs> you can come here with the scoop and scoop up what you need. My God. <laughs> we, we don't use small bags in work. You know, no. everything is 25 kilos, so I have to pick it and put in the castle. Where are you going with that? So he came in today and we're all like, oh, look at Alberto. Okay, so okay. how do we do this? Pastry. What do we do? So it, it, it's a door, okay? It's a okay. two-step door. You have to make what's called a starter. That it's very simple because usually you make starters or bigger when you make bread and it's a one day preparation. So this one is just uh, yeast, a uh, little bit of flour, a little bit of milk uh, and uh, butter and you make a little bowl, a little dough that I have here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You make it about an hour, two hours before. Okay. You and then you just let it out and it proves a little bit, okay? So what happens is... You have you... to put it in the fridge, you have to put no, it... No, no, you can leave it out on the table. It, okay. But you need to leave, you de- definitely need to make it an Absolutely. hour or two. Absolutely, you need to make it at least two hours in advance. At least you know? two and, hours. and you can do two steps. You can do that little dough and then the filling of this dough because you can see uh, inside you have to put a mix that is done with butter, sugar and vanilla, okay? It, 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 nothing difficult, you just mix... I mix it here with my hands, so there's no need of special tools. No need of special crazy okay, butter, so work sugar, away. So what are you doing? So go on, put so it on So what you're doing is, now, I have here the little starter that I have, so you can see it, it's in here. Yep. And then you still put inside the rest of the uh, ingredient, that it is flour, a little bit of more uh, yeast, fresh yeast. Yeast, yeah. And then you just start to mix it. And okay. as you mix it, you know, it looks dry, but then you start to put in milk, and the milk will start to get it all together, okay? Okay. You put in milk, it is, and it starts to get together. Then you have inside also some sugar that we're gonna just put inside. How much okay. sugar is that? It's about 150 grams of sugar, okay? We're gonna put, it, it's a quite straightforward recipe. You know, okay. you make the dough, and then once it starts to get together like this, that's when you add the two eggs. It, it, it's not messy at all, you know, in, okay. in a way, you know? And for uh, all ingredients and for amounts and everything, you can go to Ireland AM, our website. It's going to be available there. Exactly. And it starts to get together with the with the eggs, okay? Once the eggs are absorbed, then you have to put inside the butter that I just cut in little pieces, okay? Yep. It's not that much, you know, okay? Okay. And again, there is 200 grams of butter, so it's not, it's, it's not craziness. And what happens is you make the oh. dough and you leave it back, you leave it inside the bowl, you cover the bowl with your cling film, and you leave it outside, and what happens is proofs. You yep. know, it proves. Yeah. And it takes about 45 minutes to one hour. If it's a very cold day, you know, And then you roll it out. And then you roll it out uh, to this size, okay? It's, it's a big rectangle. And with the spatula, I spread inside on top of it the sugar, vanilla, and butter mix. That you'd okay? made earlier on. I yes. made earlier on. Now, this is, is the fun part, because then you have to roll it. Okay, you make a big sausage out of it, and simple as. Because I'm just, I can't understand how this is going to turn into the cake that I see in the oven there. So <laughs> I'm, I'm dying to see how this it's works. It's the baking, you know. And then, you know, if you put a little piece of paper under, it's easier to roll, so it doesn't break, okay? Oh, lovely. Uh, and then you have these rolls, okay? So what happened here is the part of the recipe that people might think complicated. Now you have to cut rolls, okay? So this is like a big sausage now. You have to cut. A roll that is a bit bigger ah, than the others, okay? okay? So you cut a roll like this and you put it in the middle of your okay, baking, baking tray. tray that has been buttered, okay? Butters. So you put the butter, don't put the flour, just the butter is fine, okay? okay? And you put it in there like that and then you cut six more pieces. Go on, do it. A little bit smaller. One, two, three. A little bit smaller, four, okay. Five and six, I Put okay? them in. You can even do seven and you put them beside. Now, when you look at it and you're like, oh, Alberto, you gave me the wrong recipe because it doesn't feel. <laughs> the baking tray, but it's a proven dough. So you do okay. like this. It expands. It expands. You do like this, you put them there, all right? And then 
egg Here wash. you have just a little bit of egg yolk, egg wash, yeah, and you put it on top, and you let it rest for about an hour. When you come back to it, it'll be proved and taken all the baking tray. So we've done about oh. two hours, then we've done about 45 minutes, depending on how cold it is, and now exactly. we're doing another hour. Okay. Another hour, you let it go. God, it's a long time, isn't it? Yeah, but like, if you cake. think this is for Mother's Day, she baked you for nine months. I'm... All right? Oh. Put, that, put that in the book, okay? <laughs> Two hours of your day or three hours for your mommy, it's nothing. All right? <laughs> That's why boys are well months. looked after by this the mommy. This is all, this yeah? is why the boy, yeah, because you make the cake. So then uh, you set your oven at 180. Yeah. You yeah. bake it for 10 minutes and you bring it down to 160. Okay. And then after 25 minutes. 25 minutes. The magic oven. Look at this. Comes Look at this. out and it's a beautiful cake. <gasps> so you can see the Alberto rolls. Alberto has expanded. berries and all in the oven on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, uh, Alberto's cake comes out with berries already on it. it's a beautiful it. cake. The roses. Because oh, no, they bring look... it back over here and show oh, us. Yes, they yeah, look back, like back roses, where it you was, get Yeah, because we can see it there. They look like roses, and then you cut it, and you serve it. And it's nice <gasps> and soft. It's like a, almost, you would call it almost like a brioche, though. Yes. So nice, now, sweet. Now, would you put custard or cream or something? Oh, over I would love custard with this. You know, you put custard or cream, but, you know, some people like even ice cream with that. No, it, it's, it's a rich cake, but it's beautiful. Is it, is it like a sponge cake, yeah? Well, no, no sponge will be softer, but this is a, a rich flavor. Oh, it's nearly like bread. It's kind of like yeah, that. It's, it's a sweet bread. It's a sweet and bread. And inside you have the sugar and vanilla that comes through. So if you serve it with, uh, like, probably, I would say warm custard. Warm custard. Best. Where's the warm custard? Okay, anyway. <laughs> with, the bar, with the bag of custard. <laughs> He's going to be outside giving out flour all day. Can you give him a second? Uh, Alberto oh, Rossi Rossi's into the no Continental problem. Hotel. Thank you so it's much for that. my pleasure. For all Grazie. the mums. Grazie. Exactly, for all the mums. Coming up, Derek's meeting some little book lovers on World Book Day. Talk to you in a minute, Ireland, dear. Welcome back. Now today is World Book Day and Derek and the children at Skullnave Forig are dressed up to the nines to celebrate. Yes, Derek, how are you getting on? Yes, guys, we're in our element here this morning because we have got the golden ticket bringing you right behind the scenes here at Skullnave Forig. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Oh my goodness, they've made such an effort here this morning. And in fact, we've got Tigger, we've got the Queen of Hearts and the Gangster Granny. I am loving the costumes, ladies. What, what, what costume? <laughs> we, we normally wear this kind of thing. I identify with the Queen of Hearts. That's a uh, principle, yeah. Anyway, Anna, Emma and Sinead are with us here this morning. And first up, Anna, we'll kick off with you because World Book Day starting today. Such an important one, really. Yes, for sure. We love, we love reading, we love encouraging reading. And no better way to do that than have the children dress up and come in and enjoy a few activities. So we do lots of things. They dress up, they, they show off their costumes, they go on a trail around the school, uh, we've guessing games, loads of activities happening here today. But not just today, all year through, we are trying to encourage reading and this is a great way to do it. I mean, this is where you need to get them when they're young in sure. primary school, right? Absolutely. I mean, it starts really, really small when they're, they're babies. You know, it's, it's having them exposed to books, enjoying it, having a great sense of uh, just enjoyment and escapism sometimes from reading a book. So if we get that when they're young, sure, listen, it's a great gift to give them, isn't it? Talking about books as well. I mean, uh, favourite book of yours, what is it? Well, the children's book was Matilda, for, for sure. I'd like to say I identified with Miss Trunchbull, but actually, Miss Honey, <laughs> I want to be Miss Honey. And uh, I got my opportunity anyway coming into the school, so definitely. Definitely a fantastic book and it's lovely to see children enjoying Matilda still. Uh, Sinead, it's so important to encourage kids and get to get into reading, right? Absolutely it is and we do our very best here. We have so many initiatives here, Derek, in the school. I mean, I could give you a list. We are currently, are some of our junior classes are taking part in Write a Book. Our fifth class actually are just waiting for their published book. They've all individually written a story and an illustration and that's going to be published in hardback, available to their friends and family. We have a paired reading initiative. So every week our senior classes read to our junior class. We've our most amazing school library and we must give a big shout out to our parent body who run that as well. Also the Lots SNA is playing an important, play an important role. Listen, there's no I in team and it's an absolute team effort here and between our staff body, student body, pardon me my head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Tigger. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, between our student body, staff body, parent body, it's, it really is a team effort. It has to be. I mean, all the kids dressed up here today. It's a real fun day for them, right? Do you know what? It feels like a holiday day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you asked the staff, but we love dress-up days in Skullnave Podrick. It's one thing we do really well around here. And we were saying earlier on, these are the days that the kids remember, right? 
Yeah. yeah, they absolutely do. You, you know, you ask any of the kids, you know, next week, you know, what was going on last week, it's dress up. It's all about dress up. They talk about it, they plan it, you know, they're drafting up costumes. And what's great is, and what we really love to promote as well, is the homemade ones, the easy ones, you know, to make it, you know, cost effective. You know, there's so many things that we all have, and it's great to see the creativity. You can see it here this morning, these boys and girls who've arrived in so early and so eager. <laughs> it's this so morning. eager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Emma, we're talking about adults reading as well. I mean, if you're not a fan of reading, where do you start? Well, I would say um, to join your local library, there's great initiatives and clubs for um, older people. And we're blessed here in Ballyrone with a fabulous library. Um, also, there's a book for everybody. So don't give up. If fiction isn't your thing, look at recipe books. Audio books is another great way of exposing yourself to reading. Talking about favourite books growing up, what was yours? Charlie and the Chocolate Charlie. Factory. <laughs> and I'm loving, I'm loving your outfit here this morning. A, a look into the future, Derek. <laughs> That's what your husband said to yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. I half five when we were up getting ready. <laughs> Anna Emma Sinead, Gurumila Magov. Now we're going to pop down here and we're going to say hello to Isabel and Louis. Good morning to you guys. Good morning. Yeah, great. Now, Isabel, tell us about your favourite book. So, I think one of my favourite books is probably The Midnight Gang. It's a really good book, I think, and it's pretty long. So, if you enjoy it, you, you have a lot to read. What do you love about reading? I feel like it can take you to a different place. You can be one moment in your living room and then you can be... A Hogwarts. Yeah, and it's, which is incredible, right? It's, yeah. yeah, it's so, I love reading. Would you encourage kids your age now to get into reading? Definitely, because I feel like now all the phones and things like that, but I think reading is still very important. Uh, what about you, Louis? What's your favourite book? Uh, probably Harry Potter. Harry Potter, I, I guess they're by the little costume. And tell me, how many books, how many of the series have you read? Um, I re only read just four. You have four of the seventh, you have three more to go. Um, what's your favourite book so far? Um, fourth one, this one. The fourth one. So Goblins of Fire. That? Goblins of Fire. Oh, Goblins of Fire. Okay. And why do you enjoy reading? Um, I enjoy because um, there's lots of story into it and details and funny things into it. So yeah, that's why I like reading. You like reading, and I believe you're heading off to France. You're going skiing soon, are you? Yeah. Are you going to bring your book with you on the plane? Yes. Good lad. And I believe you've got your com uh, confirmation coming up. Right? Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow with some of the girls there, and you got your nails painted. Got my nails there. done. Absolutely. <laughs> now before. Before we let you go, Tigger, come over to me yeah, here. I need to get my rawr. Rawr. Uh, Where can we find out more online? Oh, so much. So you can look at the World Book Day website, uh, worldbookday.ie, and then you can log on to our own website, snp.ie, or follow us on Twitter. Okay, so to Emma, Anna, Emma, Sinead, Tigger, Gangster, Granny, the Queen of Hearts, Isabel and Louis, from everyone here in Skull Lake Park, big cheer, guys. Woo! I mean, look at the effort. Back to studio. That's incredible. What and, an effort, yeah. Woo! And not forgetting Willy Wonka. Oh. He's amazing. And not forgetting Willy Wonka. Kula Boss. Kula Boss and Willy not Wonka Willy there. Wonka. Fantastic. He's some fella for the names, isn't oh, he? Oh, I'm telling Just you. He keeps on going. He's unbelievable, our Derek. No. And Thank there's more so books much. still to come. There they, is indeed. As well as they're off the telly and onto the airwaves. Gavin and Stacey star Joanna Page and EastEnder icon Natalie Cassidy, who plays Sonia, joins us for a chat a little later. 30 years. 30 years in EastEnders. Plus, from music to magic torches, we've got interactive books for children this World Book Day. We'll be back with you shortly on Ireland AM. Very welcome back. TV royalty, Myrna O'Connell, sitting <laughs> with me this morning. <laughs> no, TV royalty. <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously, TV royalty. Serious TV royalty. <laughs> uh, we've got riveting reads and casual clothing all coming up. We in the do final indeed. Hour. One's an EastEnder legend and the other one is one half of Gavin and Stacey. Natalie Cassidy and Joanna Page join us to chat all things telly at 9.20. Yeah, looking forward to that. Now, comfort is key in today's fashion slot. Lorna, what have you got for us? Good morning. Today is all about not only comfort, but how we're going to marry that with style for spring, summer. So we've got some great pop-on outfits today, like this dress, which has so many details on it that you may not be able to see up close, but I'll tell you all about them later on. 
It has Looking spots. Looking forward to it. It has Polka spots. Das. Nor Polka Polka das. Nor Polka das. Nor don't that, let him, don't let him stir the pot too early. Is that one of the details? Spots. Well spotted. Well spotted. <laughs> well spotted. Do not let him rise you this early in the morning, Lorna. And we are, I just want to look at Lorna's new haircut. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank okay. you, darling. Long, I want that. Show. I'm going to go get it done after the show. And in celebration of World Book Day today, we're looking at interactive books for little ones. Elena Ryan is here. What have you got with you today, Elena? Good morning. I have got a brilliant selection of books for the youngest readers, right from brand new newborn babies up to kids who just might not be ready to sit still and listen to a story. So lots of things to find, to press buttons on, to play with. Looking forward to showing you what we've got. They look good. There we go. So we've spots and newborn babies reading books. There you go. There you go. We're just gonna... <laughs> Speak... gonna... La, la, I swear to God, I'm sorry. What Speaking of books, Derek... What does he want from people? <laughs> Weakening up World Book Day by channeling his inner, inner Willy Wonka. Derek, hey, look at him. How are you getting on, Derek? Yes, good morning, guys. Welcome down here to Skull Name Park. We're having great fun here for World Book Day. Uh, Eliza, who are you dressed up as? Uh, we're Amanda Broom. Oh, Amanda Broom, and I love your little book there, Room on the Broom. Cara, who are you dressed up as today? Um, Augie from Wonder. And what's your favourite book? Wonder. There we go. And we have little Ava here. Who are you dressed up as, Ava? A baby. And I believe you've got your little Susan there. Put in your little Susan there. And would you believe we have got four Harry Potters. Big wave there, guys. <laughs> oh, we're having lots of fun here at Skull Day Park. But for me and all the crew, back to studio. I was wondering oh, the if... Harry Potters are cute. I was wondering if there'd be oh. a Where's Wally. I spotted two. Where? Did you spot any? What's Where's Wally? Where's Wally? The show, the book Where's Wally? OK, I'm going to explain <laughs> to him what Where's Wally is. No, I do. Do no, I know it? He has no idea what it is. <laughs> uh, so while I do that, I can't believe he doesn't know what that is. Hi, welcome So that's back. Where's Wally. Had you seen him before? No. Not really. So you'd never found, you've never found Wally. You've never found a Wally. I find, I a, find a Wally in every day. Life. I found a few Wallys in my life, but not in, not in that book. <laughs> now, we were chatting earlier on about Marion Keys and her new book and the way her mother is our harshest critic yep. and her mother's like, goes through her books going, filth, filth. And she said to her, why can't, why you, can't write, you just write nice books? Write a nice book. <laughs> so we asked you to send in some of the comments that, well, Irish mammies would sort of... The harshest of, things your yeah. mother said Jar to Jarlett you. Regan, harsh. Jarlett Regan Instagrammed me and he said, it's about time Ireland AM is talking about what the mothers in Ireland really say. <laughs> the hard-hitting things here on Ireland AM. <laughs> Catherine says, I asked my mum, why was I not born rich instead of beautiful? And she replied, God love you, you were done out of both. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> my friend's mother, this is from Maria, my friend's mother told her, you look great from behind, it's just when you turn around. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't. These are, listen, Kevin, we're getting these in. This is from Kevin. Because we were there going, this is all going to be from women. We've got Kevin, who's oh, texting. Oh, Kevin, oh, yeah. But, but it was about... But, but guess who it's about? Yeah. It's not about Kevin. When my mother first met my now wife, she said to me, hasn't she lovely teeth? Are they her own? Are they her own teeth? Did she go, <laughs> she, are they turkey teeth? No, it was too young then to get <laughs> turkey teeth. Not even one slag about him. Um, no, oh, we have one from Stuart. Oh, okay. Stuart says, my mother once told me I shouldn't cut my hair so short because I don't have a good looking enough <laughs> face for it. Oh, Your face is not good God. looking enough for that short haircut now. Um, Marguerite says, on my wedding day, what oh, would your mother say to you on you your wedding day? You look beautiful, you're stunning. You're amazing, you're the best you're the the light best. of my life. My mother told me, you look grand. Isn't that nice? Looking forward to that. You look grand. <laughs> well done. Um, my, when the morning uh, we announced our parents that we were getting engaged, this is from Catherine. 32 years ago, we said, ma'am, dad, we're getting engaged. My mother says, well, the devil you know is better, the devil you don't. <laughs> we weren't <laughs> Who sure. Who was that about? Who that was about. Sure, the devil you know what? is better, the devil you don't. You might as well get married anyway. And can I do oh, this no, this final is, this one? Oh, no, this is terrible. This is, a, this is anonymous. Shocking. So it just says here, sorry, this is after jumping on me. It goes, when the exorcist came out again, my mother said, oh, I can't watch that. The part when her head is spinning and getting sick in bed always reminds me of you. <laughs> <laughs> what were you like what? as a child? What? What? Some demon, demonic what were you child. Like as a child. 
Thank you oh, so, so much. Oh, love them. They gave uh, us Ahead a great of Mother's laugh. Day, doing what really matters. Letting our parents, <laughs> let our mothers be harsh. It's what they do best. Oh, God. Oh, uh, now, up next, EastEnders legend, Natalie Cassidy, known for playing Sonia, of course, is going to be telling us about her brand new podcast. We're going to be right back after this. <laughs> Now, thanks for staying with us. So looking forward to this because our next guest is known for playing the iconic character of Sonia in EastEnders for the past 30 years, which she's recently swapped the soap opera for podcasting. How's Natalie Cassidy. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? It's so lovely to have you because you just said you're in L Street right now. You're filming. You're filming today in EastEnders. I certainly am. I've come in early for you. So, you know, okay. be lucky. You are so good to us. You're Thank so you good. so much. But it is <laughs> like, Sonia, when I was reading this, I was like, there's no way it can be 30 years. And I know it must be said to you all of the time. That's mad. That's mad. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's exactly my thoughts. I really, I, I try not to think about it too much because, yeah, I started in 1993 <clears throat> and I was 10 years old. I know I had a I had 12 years and then I had an eight year gap and then I've been back for another 10. So it really is, you know, my home. It's been great. I, and just when you're looking back on that, the storylines. But what always I love is that you have worked with some of the biggest characters in British soaps and on television, like your, your Barbara Windsor's. And I know you had a lovely relationship, which was one of my favorites, which was Doc Cotton and June, June Brown. And oh, you, the two, was... of, uh, the two of you just were so gorgeous together. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, there she is. Yeah, I mean, she was such a dear friend to me. And, you know, honestly, going back 15 years, June would have been around, you know, the 80 mark. And we were going out to restaurants and having yeah. bottles of wine and going to gay clubs, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> Um, and she was 80, and you just didn't realise she was such a young soul. She was a wonderful lady, and she taught me so much, really. She because really. Did, when you just remind me of her, when you say go to the gay clubs and stuff, I mean, when we saw her on Graham Norton with Lady Gaga, I mean, oh, iconic. Yeah. No. She was just brilliant. Iconic. <laughs> yeah, she's iconic. She really was. Oh, God, rest her. But I think when, when we go, Sonia made such a big impact. She was 10 years old mm. when she arrived. And when you mm. think about, like Ryan Reynolds says about his own children, if they were going into showbiz, he's like, just put them straight into rehab. Because when you were... When you were doing this, Sonia, for those that first 12-year stint, it was height mm. of tabloids, of magazines, of your personal life being invaded. Mm. What was like what yes, was it, it like off screen? Um I think I had a very lucky time of it because obviously social media wasn't out there. Mm. So I think it's very, very difficult now for the youngsters. Much more difficult than it was for me. But I had a very, very normal family around me. I've got two older brothers. I had a lovely mum and dad. And I think, you know, great friends, normal school. So I think I had all the right people around me to keep my feet on the ground, you know. And uh, I just see it as a great job. I love acting. I love, you know, podcasting now. And I just feel very grateful. But I don't think I'm more special than anybody. And I think that's uh, very important. And over the years, did was it nearly your second family on the set of, of EastEnders? Were they there to support you and get you through stuff? Oh. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've lost both my parents, unfortunately. And I lost my mum at 19 and I lost my dad. It'll be three years in April. And, you know, everybody at work, you know, they knew my mum and dad because I've been here for so long. Mm -hmm. So it really, you know, it's a wonderful place and, and it's supportive. We have a laugh every day. And it really is like a big family, you know, and not just the people you see on TV, but more, more importantly, the people behind the scenes, you know, people from props and makeup and costume. You know, they're all very, very dear to me. So, yeah, it is like a big family. That's so lovely. And mm. we're very sorry for your loss because, um, you know, it's hard. Oh, that's okay. Reminding things like that. That's life. That is life. That is life. And but like speaking of like that sort of life and this longevity you've had that not an awful lot of people get to replicate, to be honest, um, with something like EastEnders, you have gotten to go off and venture into various other mm. things in your life, which is great. And one of those things now is you have got a brand new podcast with Joanna Page, who unfortunately can't be with us today uh, from Gavin and Safety. You're talking about telly. 
We're just talking about telly. It's called Off the Telly. You can get it on BBC Sounds and other platforms. Um, yeah, and it's it's lovely. It's it's just us each week reviewing what people are watching. So it's half an hour-ish, so it's easy to pick up and just do on a dog walk or, you know, your food shop or what have you. And we just want it to feel like you're turning it on and you're having a cup of tea with us. And it's just us two chatting away. And we're just two 40-something mums, really. Um, but we're very honest. I'm very honest with my reviews. Um, and, yeah, I, I really think, you know, it's just a nice thing to listen to and hopefully we can be friends to the people that listen. And is it is it shows that have just gone out that week? Like recent shows or do yeah, you go so back in very, time? It's very... Yeah, well, it's very, it's current at the moment, but I think the brilliant thing about podcasting is we can do specials. So I would love to do a special with Joanna and Griller about Gavin and Stacey because I loved Gavin yes, and Stacey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, there's been talk about it coming back for Christmas. For Christmas. She's not letting on, but I'm going to get it. I'm <laughs> going to get it out of She's her. saying nothing. She's saying nothing. Yeah. I, nothing at all. Nothing. But I'm trying and I'm not getting anywhere, but I'm really hoping it's true. The rumors are true. Because the thing is, I suppose, when you're a part of the acting fraternity and then you're there and you're like, God, I thought that was rubbish. Because you did, like, you had this whole episode where Joanna was like, oh, my God, one day was amazing. And you were like, that was crap. Yeah, I know. I didn't quite say crap. <laughs> but, um, I, I did, um, you put your words into my mouth now. You're going to get me into trouble. But I, I did, you know, I just felt it was a bit slow. But th this week we're actually reviewing for next Wednesday. We, uh, we're doing Alice and Jack. Um, and lovely Donald Gleeson is in that. And I have watched it, and uh, I watched it all night last night. I couldn't put it down, uh, and I finished at 2 a.m. So, you know, there are things I, I hate, that. and there are things I love. But you guys have got some amazing actors, right? Well, you've, yeah. well, you've worked with Donald. I have, yeah. We did a, a, com a scripted comedy podcast called Springleaf. Uh, by Jane, the lovely James Acaster, the uh, comedian. And Domo and I played gang leaders. It, it's quite a funny one. Yeah, you could download I that I can't too. see it. Like, he's a tall fella, but I can't imagine being very gang... intimidated by Donald. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's such a nice chap. I know. Well, you know, it's a, it's a podcast, so uh, it's no visuals. <laughs> yeah, the voice exactly. is very threatening. Yeah, good point. Uh, one of the other things that you did when you weren't in, in, in EastEnders, and it's back on the air now, the celebrity Big Brother. You did yes. it in two, 2012. What was your yes. experience and what, what advice would you give to these people who are in there now? And ha do you very, think it's different? It, yeah, I, um, I don't think it's different, really. I watched the launch show, because yeah. we, we're going to be chatting about that too. Um, and it really did bring back the memory of standing there, you know, and, and thinking, what have I let myself in for? <laughs> but um, a lovely Louis Walsh going in there, you know, it's, <laughs> it's great fun with Sharon and everything. But my advice really is to not do shows like that unless you're happy being yourself. Right. Because yeah. for, for the time those cameras are on you, you do forget they're there, believe mm. it or not. You okay. really do. Um, and I think if you're false or trying to sort of be someone you're not, it will come out in the end. That is so yeah. true, 100%. Really well. If sometimes if you've got a game yeah. plan and everyone's like, I can see yeah. your game plan. Absolutely. I just went in, when I went in, I cooked, I cleaned, I had a laugh, I walked in treacle and I dyed myself blue in a bath, like a blueberry. <laughs> and then I just come home again. So it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. All done. Yeah, and to be fair, I don't think Louis Walsh cares what anyone no. thinks about him, so he's going to be absolutely fine. And he's fine. The podcast is called Off the Telly, and you can get it on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcast. Natalie Cassidy, who is there filming EastEnders today in L Street Studios. But well, we have to ask her, Natalie, what, what's going on? What's the storyline you're filming today? You're going to have to watch uh, it. You know I'm not allowed to tell you. Six weeks ahead, <laughs> love. <laughs> Natalie, More than that. thanks a million for chatting to us this morning. Thank Cheers. You so Thank much. you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a million. Thanks so much. Lovely. Dose, pure dose. Now, lots more still to come. We've educational but engaging reads for your kids. Yeah, will you learn what Where Is Wally is before the end of the show? <laughs> Probably not. Plus, we've got casual chic styles on the catwalk. We'll talk to you shortly on Ireland AM. We're keeping it casual and colourful on the catwalk today and hopefully not catty.
<laughs> you were like, so what, we're looking at Jock? L Lorna Waitman is here to keep us in style this morning. Good morning to Lorna. Good morning, polka dots, not spots. Oh, polka dots, <laughs> not spots. Okay, let's get on our first look. And this so, is Hannah. Hannah's coming. We're, our looks today are from Casual Company. So you've got lovely Irish designed pieces for your everyday style. And it's all so practical with comfort kind of underpinning mm. everything. With the co look, and just to, to clarify, it's a coordinated outfit. So co matching, matching. No, but fair play to you, because I, a couple of years ago when these started coming out, had to Google that. I was like, why is everyone yeah. co no, so, But this is sold together then. Sold together, right. as a, yeah, as a, as a, as a piece. As but a you piece. can obviously wear it separately if oh, you yeah, want to. Yeah. But one of the couple of things about this is that it's pop on, it does everything that you need in one kind of single look, which I love. Comfort is the factor here. It's got a lovely kind of sloped shoulder seam. You'll see that it just comes right over your shoulder. So it's really flattering along your neckline okay. for something that has a looser fit. And that's a big trend for this season. We've got a lot of looser fabrics coming in. I love this color because lilac what mauve. What is that? Mauve. Very, very old school term. I haven't mauve. heard mauve in years. Isn't mauve it's the best mauve. word? It's the best word. And it also comes in some other colour yeah, combinations as well. The jogger kind of style pant, elasticated waists are one of my favourite things as a stylist yeah. because you can wear them wherever you want along your body. So up over your hips, at your hips, wherever you want. And then by tucking in the top, you're just creating some shape with two kind of looser outfits. So you create really nice definition. And these are a shorter kind of ankle grazing yeah. length. And it's great to wear with a flat runner. So it's very everyday, very lightweight fabric as well. So for spring, summer, when we get to some nice kind of light you know, bright days that are a little bit warmer. Gorgeous. I think this is definitely a staple for a wardrobe. Absolutely Lovely. fantastic, Hannah. Thank you so much for that. We're going to look at Emily in our next one. This so is this is the polka dots when oh, I said polka spot. Polka, polka dots. Spot. Yeah, and do you know what? The polka dots aren't all the same size on this dress as well. They're all kind of mismatched. So there was another kind of secret to this dress. So we had a little bit of a sneak peek of this earlier. And it's one of those dresses that I definitely have learned how important comfort is, having had a baby, mm. that like it's it, to move in fabric is so yeah. important and that's what this dress does but also that neckline is a soft kind of square so you'll see it kind of slopes around it's really flattering so you get to wear some jewelry and yeah. sometimes with print it's hard to kind of accessorize with print but this allows you to do that but this dress is just one of those things that if you want to experiment with print this is such a nice way to do it because it's black and white and it does come in some color options as well but what you'll notice on the close-up is that there are seams there to create some really subtle yeah, shape one, two, yeah, yeah it's like a tiered stuff. effect yeah. so you've yeah. got the empire line you've got a lower seam there as well that just hugs beneath the hips and that creates some really lovely float so and volume lovely. yeah lovely volume you've got a lovely little puff sleeve on that as well so there's so many details to this dress that make it such a winner and pockets and pockets, pockets and you're keeping course. very casual yes. with the runners yeah we've got runners with everything today and it's just to show you don't have to dress up every dress you have in your wardrobe you can be really kind of on the go with a nice flat and i'm such a fan of runners i have to thank whoever brought athleisure back as a trend because go. this works so well with these dresses as well so and you we've have got added jewelry look. we have added jewelry and it, that gold actually which has a warmer tone against the kind of monochrome of the dress mm -hmm. is a lovely contrast but it's really like emphasizing what you can do with a neckline of a dress like that which i really really yeah. love and it has a really kind of delicate puff sleeve as well so you'll see the tiered necklace looks really pretty yeah. with it gorgeous said, very comfortable really comfortable mm -hmm. and thank it's you, Emily. it's about pop on yeah, you know, pop and, on and go. Yeah, yeah, and taking the stress out of dressing, which is what casual company yeah. do really well, cool, I think. Cool, Christina. So Christina has a, a wrap style dress that actually isn't technically a wrap style dress. And that's what I okay, love yeah. about this. So you'll notice it has that crossover along the bust line, but it doesn't actually tie. So it takes out the fuss with a dress. So, so you just put it on. It's great for breastfeeding, which I think my, I've talked about more than anything <laughs> over the last six months. But also with a dress <laughs> like this. I wasn't this. expecting that comment. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's it was just like. Will stay okay. off. But you know, it's actually a really. How many years on this show? I know, but right. I wasn't expecting that. Um, it's also really flattering if you do have a fuller bust line as well. So it's very flattering crisscross over, but it's nice and secure. The print is also really pretty and small. So if you're getting into print, a smaller print is the 
the way to do it. Well, but you'll see the, like this. I do. the frill sure detail, do. elasticated waist, again, is so nice because it does create a lot of shape and cinches you in. So it allows the dress to flow down your body, yeah. but keep your body in proportion. And it's a lovely length just below the knee as well. And this comes in, I know it's got pockets as well, but this comes in various designs various and sizes. Yes, and sizes as well. So if you don't go for the print, you can look for some other options and they're all available on the website, which is casualcompany.ie as well. So lovely. So we're still in runners. I'm just keeping it really nice and... Um, oh, these ones are sandals. <laughs> these are sandals. I was going to say, I have, I run, have, I, have I missed the fashion? I'm getting the ahead of myself. Yes, they're also known as runners. Sandals with this one. And you know what's funny? When I was putting these sandals on going, this is such a versatile dress that you could do a runner with as well. So all the other ones can. that we have, you can also restyle with as well. Um, but when you've got a slip-on kind of sandal like this, you actually, with a longer length dress, you see a little bit more leg. So you create a little bit more elongating along your body as well. What, what's this? Is this, this is a hair, hair clip? clip. A hair clip. So if you don't want to go with accessories like jewellery or anything, hair clips are actually having a bit of a moment. They're having a really so big moment. They're really, yeah. really big. And actually, they're a lovely addition to a pretty dress like this because it does kind of balance and kind of complement the style each other. She's and got the healthiest hair I've ever seen. Christina has the amazing. most amazing hair. We've been talking about it all morning. Oh my God. Yeah, I yeah. That's and lovely. I think she works this dress so, out. so beautiful. Amazing. Okay, Gorgeous. Hannah for our final. So oh. we're back to the co oh. the co word again, but red. And I think red is the most empowering colour. I absolutely love it. You know, but if you want to go for a little black and khaki, this um co word also comes I in those colours as well. It's the softest fabric, I have to say. So with something like this, um, it's a jogger style trouser as mm -hmm. opposed to the wide leg trouser that we had earlier on. So you've got that lovely pretty cuff at the bottom, which works really well with flat shoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks so, so well. But the colour you can see is it's just jumping off camera and we've got a V-neckline here. So with a V-neckline, I love that it kind of creates a bit of space between your jawline and your bust line. Yeah. So even with something that is a very casual look, you have lovely kind of elegant detail with it. And you can pull up the sleeves if you want to create a little bit of extra space styling but these kind of the style between a jogger and a runner I think is something that's very much a staple when it comes to fashion now Gorgeous. but again there. if you wanted to dress that up you can put the heel with it as well Absolutely. little, pair of earrings, little, little, pair little earrings, earrings as well yeah metals are really having a bit of a moment when it comes to jewellery but also gold and red is such a gorgeous it really, combination really so is. everything is available from casual company it's all available online Hannah thank Lorna. you so much Lorna thank you thank so you. much Roger. the new do you have to take that out you have to have a babysitter and take that out gorgeous thank you so much Lorna Waitman now up next uh, if you're looking to ignite your child's passion for reading we've got the perfect page turners yeah we'll see in a few minutes Welcome back. Whether creating your own fairy tale or exploring the rainforest, we're looking at bringing books to life for children. Yes, and helping us to do that with her top picks are for tots is CEO of Children's Book Ireland, Elaine Ryan. Good morning to you. Good morning. We're starting at the very young. Yes, this very, morning. very young. And it's never too young. So I think one of the things we hear a lot is that parents or carers will start to read with their kids when they can read. Mm. And we want them to start from the very start. So this one you can fold out if you want to pick it up more and you can see it's a big fold out book that you can use when newborn babies are doing tummy, tummy time. time. So your public health nurse will recommend that the baby lies on their tummy for a certain amount of time every day to strengthen their muscles. But it's also when their brain is developing so okay, quickly. So you show bed. Teddy, yeah, so their first words, dog. it's a high contrast book. So it's black and white and bright colours because we know kids' vision is limited when they're so, so tiny. And on the other side of the book, there's a mirror. So we know that babies love seeing their own face. Okay. They might not recognise their own face. They'll think it's a baby. And the rhyme is always, I see something. So you can say, I see mammy, I see daddy. I see daddy bird, sees I me. see tog, yeah. dog, Teddy. I see, so it's I, like see I see Alan. the Tummy time. Tummy so time. So it's just from the very, very start. Very, very beginning. Oh, Moving yes. on to our second one. This is for one-year-old. Yes, Machaid Ryan Goelga. So this is my first Irish nursery rhymes. And this is a sound book. It has a little button inside it that you can press. And it makes a sound. <laughs> okay, that looks really weird. I look like I'm breastfeeding a book. Yeah. But this book um, is beautiful. It's by Richard McLean and Tatiana Feeney. The illustrations are gorgeous. It's lovely to have 
nursery rhymes, Os Gaelge, Os Gaelge. because so many of the nursery rhymes that we get are maybe CDs from the UK or the US. And I think this is a really beautifully done version because some of the, the songs are kids singing. It's quite and solid, some are adults, so it's going and it's to a last. Board book. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And on my Irish Kids Books website, you can buy replacement batteries. Equally, if kids are pressing it a lot, you can switch it off at the back and not all noisy things in the house no. have an off oh, yeah. switch. Well done, yes. Elena. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's There's very lots good. in this series as okay. well. Okay, Dance Like a Flamingo. Dance this is like for three-year-olds. Off. Alan is going to be our beautiful assistant today, I believe. So Dance Like a Flamingo <laughs> is a like fabulous a flamingo. book by Moira Butterfield and Claudia Bolt. And each animal in this, from flamingos to jellyfish to penguins, have movement. So we learn a little bit about the animal first, and then there are four <laughs> easy movements that children can do. So this is great in school setting, Montessori setting, but equally at home. So Where's firstly, Derek in his Willy Wonka <laughs> outfit when you need him? <laughs> <laughs> this is what you get for not knowing where's Wally. So stretch up tall, flying flamingo. What's that? Yeah, stretch up tall. There we yeah, go. Up on your tippy toes, strut around. You're very proud. <laughs> very proud. Yes. Flamingo. Stretch out your wings to show their <laughs> colour. You're doing that already. You're fabulous. <laughs> yep. And take a bow. What take. a beautiful bird. There we go. Well done. <laughs> Gorgeous. So this is not a bedtime book, I will tell oh, you. Oh, no. <laughs> you just naturally did that. You were like, let's go. Yeah, you just, you I got it. this. I got <laughs> this. But this is a book. All of these books require a child to do something. So if you do have a child okay. who's a little bit reluctant to sit down and just listen to a oh. story, that bit of movement oh, will get them turning the pages of a book and coming back to it. Brilliant. Okay, right. Once Upon a Fairy Tale. This is for age yes. four up. This one is like, do you remember Choose Your Own Adventure? Yes. In the 80s oh, and 90s where it was, you had to pick something. This is like a very simple Choose Your Own Adventure by Lauren and Natalia O'Hara. Lauren O'Hara is based here in Ireland. This book is gorgeous looking, but also on each spread of the book, there's a choice for children to make. So from the very start, from the Once Upon a Time, yeah. they get to choose. They choose Once Upon a Rainy Tuesday or Once Upon a Broken Chair. And as they move through, every spread has a choice to make on it. So you can see once that they pick. Once Upon a Broken Chair? What's yeah. Once Upon a Broken Chair? Well, you have to use well, your imagination. Use your next? Oh, so it's I a fairy see. tale. The child is the hero. And okay. every time they read this book, they can choose a different character, a different villain, a different reward for when they achieve their quest. So it becomes a different story every time they read it and it puts the child in charge. That's Lovely, very, very gorgeous clever. book. Really, really beautiful. Okay, done. The Magic Torch. The Magic Torch. This Five is ups. so cool. Uh, so this book has a UV torch that comes with it and this is an early copy. It's out next week on the 14th and we'll pop it down here so that you can see. You switch on your little torch, your UV light and on each page of this book there is invisible ink. So you can see there are creatures hidden. Oh look! So you're walking through the Amazon with this little girl, Clara, and her dog, Sparks, and you have to find the secret creatures that are hidden in this orange invisible ink. And at the back of the book, it will show you what you're looking for. So this is a snowy egret hidden in there. But as you move it over the page, there are other little things oh. hidden. You might find little flowers or little oh, butterflies okay. on every page. So there's enough information in it that you're learning a little bit about the animals and the plants. Beautifully illustrated, really, really nicely done. But this book is just something that is a little bit different because of this torch. So again, it feels like a play thing. Um, yeah, really, really nice like a done. toy they, as well when, as be, when you get that type of thing, does the book become more expensive though? It does, yeah. Mm. So it is a little bit more expensive. Yeah. This one, you can order it online or you can pre-order it on chapters. But I think we spend so much on plastic toys that yeah. kind of get discarded. You're yeah. going to get a lot of a life lot of out, of out of this book. This, and again, yeah. you can replace the batteries in the little torch. Okay, find Tom in time. Now, find Fatty Tom Burke. In time. We love Fatty Burke, Waterford Illustrator. This is a whole series. I've brought four of them in today. There's six, I think, in total. So I'm missing Michelangelo's Italy and Shakespeare's London. But here we have Find Tom in Time, Ancient Rome. So Tom is a little boy whose granny is an archaeologist. Every now and then she finds an item like a coin, hands it to I him. I was trying to find Tom. Tom goes on. disappearing. So on every can't spread. Find Wally, so I, can't I don't find know. Wally. I, find <laughs> I can't find Wally. I was trying this to find is, Tom instead. It's <laughs> like an Irish illustrated where Sorry, is Wally? My life. So we might have to leave one of these here for you. But this is very much a seek and find book. So yeah. on every So he's spread. on every page and you have to find him on every page. And Granny B is on every page. And there's a list of other things to find. But as you go, they're explaining to you what those things are. So if you have to find the papyrus, oh, they're telling right. you about what's happening in And the Pantheon and stuff Egypt. like that are in the exactly. Pantheon. Exactly. Okay. So the pages, as you can see, Fatty Burke's illustration is so distinctive, really busy. There's An amazing loads going illustrator. on. Such Medium a brilliant illustrator. Uh, yes. Fatty Burke, brilliant. And they're so good. And we're introducing you to the concept of 
Where's Where's Bobby? Bobby? Yeah. <laughs> 50 years later. Can we ask you very quickly about the initiative uh, Children Bo Children's Books Ireland are doing for World Book Day, which yes, is today. Yes, it's today. We're so pleased. So in partnership with Unpost, we are giving away 3,150 books by Irish authors and illustrators to children who might not otherwise have access to them. So children in hospital, children using the services of Bumbalance to go on healthcare journeys, children experiencing homelessness and living in direct provision. And this is the kind of work that we as a charity do all year round. So if people want to find out more about it, want more recommendations or want to donate to Children's Books Ireland, they can go to childrensbooksireland.ie. Lena well Bryan, that's a brilliant well initiative, CEO really of Children's is. Books Ireland. Thank and, you so and much. Say, Cheers. Plastic toys that you might be buying them if you buy them a book and then get them started reading young. Exactly. Yeah. And these are books that they will love. They're all so much fun. They're the books that they will ask to go back to. And when you have series like Find Tom in Time, it gives them a path yeah. for something to read. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for that. Cheers. Now that's all we've got time for today. Coming up tomorrow, we're showcasing all things girl power for International Women's Day by discussing current issues facing the women of Ireland. Yes, today. join the all-female presenters of Elaine, Shiva and Brooke tomorrow morning from 7. But from us, have a great weekend. Bye-bye.